Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Peggy Global Classroom Series. My name is Yok Ling and I will be your host today. Before we begin, let's do a quick tech check. Um, please type yes if you could hear me and see me clearly. Okay, great. Let's proceed. May I invite all of you who are watching to this episode um, to comment below and let us know where you are co connecting in from. Um, I know tonight we have hundreds of registrations coming in from all over Malaysia, from our campuses in Penang, Kuala Lumpur, Subang Jaya and Sarawak. And we have participants from overseas as well. So please comment below and let us know where you are coming from. Okay, uh, let's see. <laughs> okay, we have um, Segi Subang, we have KL, we have Sarawak, and uh, SJ, KL, Sarawak, Subang, Jaya. Okay, um, well, welcome everyone. Okay, so. On behalf of SEGI Group of Colleges, I would like to welcome everyone once again to this webinar under SEGI Global Classroom Series. SEGI Global Classroom Series consists of many episodes of webinar and sharing sessions from our global networks of speakers and experts to ignite the passions and curiosity of our students. It also serves as a platform for our students locally in Malaysia to network and learn from international students um, from our partners' institutions all over the world, including United Kingdom, United States of America, uh, Switzerland, and Finland. We are honored to, tonight to have Associate Professor Dr. Derek Watson from University of Sunderland joining us. Dr. Derek Watson will be sharing on sharpening your academic writing skills and personal learning strategy. Before I introduce our speakers to everyone, let me walk you through how we will conduct our sessions tonight. The presentations will take approximately 45 minutes, and after that, we will open up the question and answer sessions. We would also like to encourage you to post your questions throughout the sessions and our speakers will try his best to answer your questions. Please also note that um, a certificate of participation will be issued to you for attending tonight's webinar. So to be eligible for this uh, certificate, please stay until the end of the webinar where a registration link will be shown for a limited amount of time. Now, let's introduce our speaker. Dr. Derek Watson is an associate professor and senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy, founder of the Faculty's Business Clinic and the doctoral leads for the University's Research Fridays program. His research focuses on cultural compliance and academic industry collaboration investigating the impacts of knowledge exchange on practice in both the classroom and the workplace. Dr. Watson has an international portfolio of clients and contacts, such as the British Cabinet's Office, Indian Government's Councils of um, Scientific and Industrial Research, Dubai Police, and uh, Canon International. So without further ado, Let's bring up Dr. Derek Watson to say hi to our viewer. Hi, Dr. Derek. Good afternoon, or should I say good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're tuning in from around the world. Yes, uh, Dr. Derek, I shall pass the floor to you. Yes, certainly. Thank you very much, Cole. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, so yes, my name is uh, Dr. Derek Watson, Associate Professor at our Sunderland UK campus of the University of Sunderland. 
And I just want to start off by saying um, Malaysia is actually my second home. As part of my very interesting and enjoyable job, I look after our t and centre in Malaysia. So I do, pre-COVID, used to very much enjoy coming out to Malaysia, trying the food and enjoying the weather and meeting students and the academic team. And hopefully that will rekindle as we move on. But yes, this is part of the SEGI Global Classroom series. And my presentation, what I'm going to be doing today, we're going to be looking at sharpening your academic writing and your personal learning strategy. Now, what I want to suggest is from the outset, please take on board what I'm trying to tell you or relate to you. Try it out and see how well it works because I've de delivered this technique for many years and I've seen a step change from students on a C grade to a B or a B grade to an A grade or from a 2-2 two -two to a 2-1 up to a first class um, classification on an undergraduate degree and postgraduate students have excelled by, by adopting these simple techniques. And I want to emphasize that they are very simple indeed. So the key, the key model that we're very interested in in higher education is the road to progression. So you start your recruitment, you join your programs, and it's this process, this transition, progression to graduation, and very importantly, employability. Now, I want to emphasize employability because, yes, it's very commendable that students graduate with their degree qualification, but you need that degree plus your interpersonal skills and knowledge to secure a career, no matter where in the world, with progression. So you need a plan and you need a system. And these are this is actually a photograph of Malaysian students, which I taught on the MBA programme. And that was, um, I think this was a, a five-day programme. So day one, you've got students on the left, and within five days, they transitioned to um, a group of very able executives. So what we're looking at is, we're looking at the input. Students going into the SEGI environment, learning environment, and out pops graduate with potential career progression and employability. So what we've got to look at, we've got to look at the learning process. Because quite often when students start, start programs with academic writing and their skills development, quite often they feel as though that do they have the ability? Do they have the confidence to progress? And let me tell you, to get through a degree, you do not need to be the smartest person on campus. But what you do need to do, you need to have a plan that works for you, in which you see yourself evolving. And education is very much like getting on an aeroplane. It's not how you start, it's very much how you land or exit second university and colleges with that degree and future employability. But let me first of all um, look at the, focusing on writing skills within that. Now, what I've got there is I've got a slide and it's the general structure of most assignments or a dissertation or a thesis. Now you look on the right hand side, there are links of a chain. The reason why I've got links of the chain is each of those sections need to connect together. Because when your tutor reads your paper or an external examiner reads your paper or dissertation, you need to take them by the hand and walk them through your introduction, literature review, research methods, how you collected the data, how you developed your discussion, how you formulated your conclusions, and in red, and I know some institutes don't ask for this, but I ask for this for my students, recommendations. Because, as I said, Work smart through the university and say colleges. Make sure that when you go for job interviews, you can take along former assignments and employers will want to look at the recommendation section. But we'll talk about that as we progress. Now, the golden thread through any assignment, any dis dissertation or thesis, the golden thread is your assignment question. If you're not answering your question, you're not going to get the grades that you deserve. And quite often, it's not on ability, it's on technique. 
So you, once again, you do not have to be the smartest person, but you do need to develop a technique that works for you. So if we look at the introduction, the introduction is you've got to develop key questions. What do you want to answer? And how are you going to collect your data? And how are you going to distribute those findings within the, the immediate or wider community? So what I tell my students is, look upon it, your introduction, as rather like an upside down triangle. What you'll try and do within about 150 words, put your assignment theme into context, and then as you're talking about it, you slowly work towards that point, your question. So people can understand from the outset, why are you putting finger to keyboard or pen to paper? Setting out your introduction is very important. Within your introduction, you will also have to have a research question. What is the question that you want to answer or investigate? So assume you're at a river. Your research question is you're on this side of the river, but you want to get over the other side. So your research question, which you'll have to cite in your introduction, then needs to have key objectives, stepping stones. So if you answer these objectives in your assignment, you will achieve your ultimate goal, getting across the river, i.e. answering your research question. So if we look at your literature review, and once again, here's the technique. What you've got to remember is you've got to read, but it's no use reading. You've got to write down notes and you've got to edit those notes. So if you're just reading, you're not sure if you're taking in the information. And whilst you're reading, you've got to identify themes. So here's the technique. You've got a topic for an assignment. You start reading and you identify um, various themes. As you progress through your reading, you'll identify journal papers that make reference to reinforce your initial assumptions that these themes are relevant. Now, when you read each paper and they identify key themes, make sure that you add your references so you can identify what are the themes and where did you get these themes from from, from your academic papers. Now, as you progress, do a chart, and then as you progress through the papers, start adding different colors to different papers that you're using. And what you'll find is theme two initially seemed quite interesting, but on further reading, you found that there was very little addressing that topic. So by doing this model, by doing the rings round, referencing key th theorists relevant to those themes, you're validating your um, your subsections that will help you formulate a topic answer in answering those research, that research question and objectives. Now, when it comes to referencing, most students, first question they say, uh, well, how many references do, do you need to pass? And the question is, how long is a piece of string? But what I will do is I'll tell you first about referencing styles. So if you're citing one author in, in your, your script, for example, Watson, you put Watson, comma, in brackets, 2021. At the back of your paper, you will have your reference section, your bibliography. Now, that's where you document the full reference source from the journal paper. And there you have the author, the year, the subject area, the research journal, the journal number, volume, and the page numbers and the ISS number included within that. However, when you're referencing a source that has more than two authors, you will document it as, for, for example, here, Doyle et al. Dot, if you are not including the Doyle in brackets. If you are including the Doyle in brackets, it's Doyle et al. dot, comma, 2021, and there's the reference within that, which you'll place at the back of your um, assignment. Now, the key to getting good grades is breadth and depth of reading. You need to be sourcing journal articles from 2022, if they're in print, 
haven't been published yet, or certainly 2021, 2020, 2019, 2018. But you need to keep your answers current because when you go for a job, you will need to talk about current themes within that. Now, going back to the initial question, how many references do I need? Well, I tell my students, when I look at a paragraph, I like to see a minimum of two references. I don't like to see an author referenced more than twice in a paper. Now, you can reference some people way back in 1990s, the 70s, the 60s, if it helps answer your question. But you cannot rely on old references because quite often there'll be subsequent papers that will look at those things and there'll be more up-to-date dialogue relevant to today's world of work. Now, research methods. Once again, students get quite confused or they feel as though it's, it's quite complicated in the minds. So let's rein it back and look at something simple. A research method is, for example, your radiator is leaking. So what do you do? You ring a plumber or a maintenance team to come out and they have a box of tools. This is very similar to your research methods. You have a problem that you need to answer, i.e., in the picture, the leaking radiator. What you have is, you have a bag of research methods. What you have to identify is which tool or tools are you going to use as that bag of research methods to help solve this problem. So the research methods you can use. Quite often, from experience, students feel as though, historically, if you use quantitative analysis research methods, you'll get higher grades. I challenge that. You'll get the same grades if you use a qualitative or quantitative approach, or indeed a mixed methods approach. Now, quite often with mixed methods, involves a questionnaire, you distribute your questionnaire, you collect the data, you analyze it, you develop interview questions from that, you distribute it, you collect the feedback, you analyze it, and those, that feedback informs the focus groups. So what we're trying to do is, we're trying to triangulate your answer to reinforce what you're seeing is credible. People might not like your answer, but they can't disprove it because you've validated it. And what we do is we talk, call that the triangulation of data. So we've got Q for questionnaire, I for interviews, FG for focus groups. A simple method such as that. And keep your language simple so people can read it. Data analysis. What we need to do, and students don't do, if they do a questionnaire, they will give the feedback. This is the feedback from question one. A nice graph and a bullet point. This is the question from question two. If you want to get good grades, look at the data, look at the questions and try to cluster them into themes. For example, theme one could consist of, and if you've got a 20 question questionnaire, it could consist of questions three, five, six, 11, 15, and 18. And theme two, one to 19, theme three, and theme four. Now, what this does, it helps you cluster the feedback under those themes. Now, no tutor is going to come to you and say, ah, you've put feedback question three into theme one. We disagree with that. They won't say that. What they want to do is see how you cognitively have looked at raw data, you've made a judgment, and you've parked them into key themes. Because in reality, these themes will overlap on top of each other. But what you've done is you've segmented it within that. When you come to the discussion section, quite often students have done the literature review, they've developed questions from the literature review for the, um, the questionnaires, interviews, or focus groups, they've collated the data, they've gone through the analyzing, grouping it into themes, which we've talked about, but here comes the important part, the discussion. What is the difference that the literature says to the data that you found? Now, I'll be open and honest with you. The data that you'll extract will not boil the ocean. And this is what I say to my PhD students, but it will make a contribution. Small, but it will make a contribution. Now, remember the slide with the links. 
Each of these sections need to link together. So once again, our literature review helps develop the questions, which helps us collect the data analysis. And once we've got that, we've then got to discuss it. And you're ahead of the game if you've clustered them into themes, because each of those themes will be a paragraph or several paragraphs. But what you need to do is, as you explain in your discussion, you're relaying your discussion, you need to make sure that you make reference to literature references cited in your literature review. There you have the link. And you will get marks for this. Because quite often, students do not get the grade that they deserve because their answer is disjointed. There are gaps. And if there are gaps, the examiner will struggle to understand and then you will lose marks. So make sure you remember the links of the chain within that. The conclusion section, quite often students are quite tired, so they want to get, get their conclusion sections over very quickly. And quite often they submit a very short conclusion. Your conclusion section, if you've got three objectives, remember these stepping stones across the river? If you've got three or four objectives, each of these objectives needs to be discussed logically, based off the data that you've collected, in your conclusion. Did you answer the key objectives within that? And there you have a clear structure to your conclusion. Now, this is the next section. We'll look at recommendations. Recommendations are critical because you can't find recommendations from a textbook. These come through your cognitive thoughts and interpretation. And the more you talk about your research or your assignment or you debate it with your class, your class friends or family members, you will help polish up your vision within that. However, organizations like higher educational institutes like recommendations broken down into strategic, senior management, tactical, middle management, operational, frontline staff. So what you've got to do with your recommendations at a strategic level, you've got to think about what can you recommend that the organization adopts in the long term? Now, the long term could be three years or three years plus. Tactical could be up to two years, medium term. Operational, what are you going to recommend in the short term, 12 months within that? Now, if you structure your recommendations with side headings, um, Below, please identify, please find my recommendations, which I have deliberately broken into strategic, tactical and operational. You've already got a structure. And quite often when students write recommendations, once again, it's half a page. And in that half a page, you're trying to tell your tutor or the external examiner, this is what I can contribute. It is way short. If you break it down into those three sections, I guarantee you your recommendations will have a structure and they will spread over one to two pages or more within that. So it's, what are you gonna recommend long-term, medium-term and short-term in a clear structured format? And you'll get extra marks for that guaranteed. However, when we start university or college, we, we think, well, I'm on a course three to four years or masters one to two years. You feel as though that time is in an abundance. However, a sign of getting older, and I'll raise my hand with this, how quick your birthday comes round. Sometimes too quick, my stress. And that shows you that if you don't manage your time effectively, time will run through your fingers. You'll lose time. So I'm a firm believer that my students and students at the university develop winning techniques. And what you've got to think about yourself, I've got a picture there of Bruno Mars. Now, if you go on YouTube and you, you scroll down Bruno Mars documentaries, Bruno Mars at a very early age wanted to be a singer, a, a world-class singer. But Bruno Mars realized he didn't have the key skills. So what he did do, he looked at his mentors, such as Michael Jackson and other singers, and he adopted their techniques into a winning formula that works very effectively for Bruno Mars. You guys need to do the same. You need to develop 
a bespoke system of learning techniques. And what I do say is students who study too hard do not develop sufficiently. So what you need to do is you have to have a yin and yang. And as I say to my students in Malaysia and in the UK, I recommend you work hard and you also play hard. But to do that, you need to have a winning system. And you need to be realistic. Embarking on your degree program isn't an army assault course. But if you start thinking that way, it will start and work against you. And you'll spend your time more time worrying, worrying than actually doing. So once again, you need a network with your fellow students because invariably you'll all be going through the same emotions. And I know for a fact the staff at um, SEGI and at the university will support you, um, our academics and the support teams wrapped around the academic teams. Also, what you need to do is you need to plan ahead, rather like a sat-nav sat system on a car. You need to plan your route map. Now, this isn't a rigid plan, but it's a plan of progression. And certainly with your induction programs, your, um, your tutors will advise you, <coughs> excuse me, on how to progress. But you need to get fixed in your mind and on paper, what is your plan of action? Rather like your uh, recommendations, operational, what are your 12 month plan? What's your 12 month plan broken down into monthly, weekly, daily within that? Now, some of you might think, well, that's a bit challenging or that may involve a lot of work. It doesn't, but it's exactly how businesses run. If you don't know what you're doing today, how can you possibly get through till tomorrow? Never say the F word, the fail word. Students who embark at SEGI colleges and university and at the University of Sunderland with our collaborative programs, if you attend class, if you show commitment, if you liaise with your tutors and your fellow students, I guarantee you, you will pass. And that's not under the door or over the wall, you will walk through that gate with your head held proud that you've earned your degree. However, it's a family affair. Going through your degree qualification, it is critical that you involve your family. You share your learning experiences with them and you talk to them about the challenges that you're facing. And also, if you get an assignment whereby you've got to contact their company, don't run off to the Apple or the Googles and the other big multinational organizations. Look to your own personal network. Think about parents, friends, relatives, partners, all who work in organizations where you can gain access to data. That is what you need to do rather than target the big multinationals, unless you do have a personal contact who actually works in those such organizations. It's very important and it's one of relationship building. When you're sat in class and your tutor is facing you, whether it's via a PC or it's face to face, your tutor will be absorbing information. They will be making judgments. Now those judgments aren't set in stone, but what they are is the first forming judgments. So it's very important that you demonstrate to your tutors that you are engaging, you are doing the necessary reading as a minimum and bringing in examples outside in the community to share in class. And this is all part of relationship building because tutors, like people in general, have different personalities. We have our good days and not so good days. So it's a team effort when we work with our students. So you need to show your tutors that you are committed and you want to contribute and you want to progress in your life. And your tutors will be there, not just in class, outside of class as well. And the supporting services will also support you throughout your learning journey. However, there's a famous phrase by, from Michael J. Fox. Michael J. Fox once said, um, everyone has a bag of hammers. And in life, Problems arise in our, in our lives when we least expect them. So what I recommend that you do, do not go through your learning journey as a sole individual. Develop a rapport with your fellow students, the academic team, 
and the university support services. Because if you need help, hand out your hand, put out your hand, and the hand will grasp that and they will offer you the support. But it is one of relationship. You have to listen to the advice that they're giving you and take it on board. If it doesn't fit, go back and they will recalibrate or remold that learning support system for you. And I would say, I tell my students, you'll think about, well, you'll hit at least one problem per year. But these problems, if they're shared quite often, the, the gravity or the seriousness isn't as important what you initially thought with that. So certainly seek help. Um, I'm going to use an example of myself. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I remember going to my supervisor, my director of studies, and saying, well, you know, I'm struggling. I'm not making the progress that I need to because I don't feel well. Or I've got a lot on on my schedule. And my tutor would always turn around. My director of studies would always turn around. And I still remember it today. I understand, Derek. But you've got to crack on. You've got to move forward. And this goes back to one of the early slides. When you're reading journal articles, you need to write, re read, write, and edit within that. And once you start getting into the zone, the groove, that you're actually driving your education, you're not being carried, you'll gravitate from that. That will give you confidence, and that will be shared amongst your team in positive energy within that. So yes, um, only you can complete your programs. Now, I would also, and this goes to exi existing students, I would develop a smart schedule. I would do, first of all, I know what some of you are thinking, 8 a.m. till 9 p.m. Is he really expecting us to work from 8 a.m. till 9 p.m.? I am not. But do a template Monday to Sunday, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. 9 p.m. is a cutoff. No one should work beyond 9 p.m. But hear me, hear me out. What you then do is you plot in in green when you have classes. On Friday evening and Saturday evening, I've got um, – um, the crazy character caricature there. No one should be studying on a Friday or Saturday evening. They are the, the evenings when you should be out enjoying yourself. That remember that yin and yang work life balance. And on Sunday evening, which is in yellow, you're making a plan. What's your plan for this week? What do I need to do for tomorrow? And what I use is posted pads. So each Sunday, I write down what I'm going to do on the Monday. And I take them up as I go through the day. And I'll do the same on a Monday night, Tuesday, Wednesday, throughout the week. But what you'll see is if you pepper in your classes in green, you'll see these white areas. These are your free periods. Now, I'm not saying that you should study in those free periods. You could go to the gym. You could watch a movie or you could have a coffee with your friends. But what you've got to identify is out of your schedule that you've got to attend class, how much free time do you have? Now, I certainly don't expect you to study every evening, six till nine, because you've got a life to live. But what we need to do is we need to work and play, study the same amount of hours. So how do we do this? So supposing I've inspired you so much today, you run home. Um, well, you probably are already at home. But tonight you say, right, I'm going to work from six o'clock till 9 p.m. I'm going to hit the books. But in reality, this isn't true because you drift in and you drift out of study. So really, out of those three hours, at best, you will do, and this is at very best, you will do one and a half hours of studying time. But yet you've wasted three hours to get that one and a half hours. So if we go back to the series here. If you can identify what you're going to be studying or researching the day before, these pockets, these white pockets of 30 minutes, 45 minutes, you can get just as much input out of those 45 minute bites or 30 minute bites than you can from a one and a half hour slot out of a three hour evening jaunt within that. Try it out. Group work is very important as well. 
or should I say teamwork? Because group work is strongest at the top, weakest at the bottom. There is a hierarchy of power. What we're trying to develop, and we will develop through your induction and your classes at SEGI, is a team dynamic. Everyone playing at the same level, moving in the same direction. And journal papers, I'll go back to the importance. Yes, you'll get recommended texts to read, but use the textbooks as a reference. What you really need to do is read and dig down and share with your colleagues. That's not plagiarism, but you're sharing with your colleagues journal papers. So you start understanding what's going on today, not what's go what has gone on five or three or 10 years ago. Um, also, a reality check. As I said before, you cannot study all the time. So what you need to do in with your schedule, when are you going to do your, um, when you're going to go to the gym, when you go to the movies, when you're going to ride your bike, exercise, whatever you want to do, pepper that into your schedule. So you have a healthy work-life balance. Always, always keep a backup because you will lose work. And at worst, print it off. Although I discourage that for green reasons, but if you can have several backups on memory sticks and make sure you put the date in so you can identify which is the most recent um, download or document that you've saved. Networking is so important. Um, I sat on a train from London to Sunderland, where I reside, a three hour train ride, and this gentleman, elderly gentleman was talking to me and all I wanted him to do is just to be quiet. Let me enjoy my train ride. At the end of our journey, he handed me his business card and he said, I own a company. I would like to invite you onto my premises on Monday and have an interview and offer you a position, a career position. And that's how I started off my consultancy career. But yet I looked at the individual as a problem. All I wanted to do is enjoy my uh, real journey. So always network. Get, embrace yourself with the SEGI learning forums. Um, guest speaker sessions, opportunities to speak to employers, but certainly network. And as the more people you network, the more confident you will be coming because most of the consultancy or business that we do at the university and at SEGI is through personal networks, global networks. Um, look for your CV from day one of your studies. Look for your, your CV and try to put in up-to-date impact evidence so when an employer reads your resume you stand out from the crowd now you need to do this from day one so look at segi's careers advice um go online but start thinking about day one of your studies how can i start developing my resume to be more pro professional and distinct from the global competition with it which is out there um the SEGI will support you. They will support you through your studies. They will support you through times of need. But also, when you get your assignments back, always make sure that you have a word with your tutors to, to understand why did you get that A grade? Or if you didn't get the A grade, what do you need to do to get that A grade? Um, treat your studies like a baby, whereby it's always in sight. You're always touching base with it. So you've got, you keep your memory muscle within that. And you can do that as well as enjoying a healthy lifestyle, um, going to the gym, movies, hobbies, interests, but you need to treat it like a baby. It's always got to be there and you've got to make sure that you keep tweaking away with your answer or your assignments or your class and uh, formative assessments. Very important, proofread. It's something that you don't do. And then when you get your assignment back, you'll think, goodness me, how did I miss those errors? Proofread it or get a friend to proofread it or a partner or a family member. Yes, it might cost you a, a burger and fries or a free diet Pepsi or a drink of coffee, but build that networking support quality assurance system. It is very important. And also, as you go through university, you'll have different emotions on how well you think you're doing. And that's why you've got to read your tutor feedback. That is critical. 
because your tutors are there that want you to pass. All you have to do is engage, participate, listen, take on board their advice, and you will see, you'll start developing your skills and your techniques. And very importantly, remember to reward yourself. This is something my tutor once told me, and I do do that. If I achieve a consultancy project, or if I achieve something um, in academia at the university, first thing I think about is, if I've achieved something, what am I gonna do to treat myself? And you guys need to think about that. However, do not treat yourself if you're not delivering. You've got to go back to basics and follow the techniques which I've relayed within the presentation. And if you do that, rather a whistle-stop tour, but if you need additional guidance, I do have a YouTube video. If you go on YouTube and you type in Dr. Derek Watson, University of Sunderland, there'll be a series of videos that come up. One of them is how to successfully complete an undergraduate or postgraduate dissertation. The principles in that video are very much relevant to all of your assignments. So if you follow that through, you will graduate, and hopefully your next graduation, I will be there in person in Malaysia, cheering you on. And with that, I'd like to hand over back to the um, to Cole, and I'm opening up to questions. Ask me any questions. Thank you, Dr. Derek, for the sharing. I'd like to open the floor now for Q&A. Let's flash the question. Okay, we have Sarah here. Um, how can you guarantee you are creating a teamwork rather than a group work? I have come to notice at most times lectures will be underway. Over sure. to you, Derek. Right, first of all, what you need to do, you need to develop group standards or team standards. What is acceptable? Now, these aren't my standards. These are our standards. So what we do is we sit down, we talk, you'll identify a group, um, or you might be put in a group, a group of five, usually in odd numbers, so it can't be a stalemate, them versus us. Once you've identified what, um, almost like a contract, a learning contract, what is acceptable? Then if somebody doesn't follow that, then you it's not you, it's the groups or teams agreement standards that the individual is falling down. Now, what you've got to remember also when you're at university, in class, you're a student. Out of class, you're friends. You might be best buddies. But when you get into class, you've got certain responsibilities. And you will know if you are not contributing. So you don't really need to rely on your colleagues to say, look, you need to attend meetings. Yes, we know you've got a part-time job, but we've rescheduled it. And what you've got to do is you've got to make sure that you develop the team dynamic. So what I encourage my students to do is if they're studying, you might do the six till nine, bring pizzas along or burgers or fries, all the unhealthy food, which you love, and sit around. And while you're eating, you're talking. And while you're talking, you're developing, you're polishing up the answer. However, sometimes individuals do not perform. So what you've got to do at the very early stage, you've got to almost like the football. You can develop a yellow card and say, your behavior isn't acceptable. We are giving you a yellow card. And if that behavior still doesn't turn around, you issue them with a red card. Now, a red card means you're then going to go as a group or team to your tutor, module tutor, and tell the tutor, this is what we've tried. And at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do, then the tutor, tutor needs to step in. But by adopting that model, quite often, if there's someone not participating, they'll probably leave the team early. But you, you can't be too rigid. You've got to be flexible, but you will know when individuals aren't participating. And what I constantly see is students keep quiet, they do not say anything to me, and then when they get the group assignment back, then students come to me whispering, but they did not do any work. How did they get an A grade? And I say, well, no one's told me. You need to keep evidence within that. So transparency, and quite often, you might not be the most popular person in the group, <coughs> but what they will do, they'll respect you, and they are key attributes for any employment. Respect first, 
friendship comes later. Thank you, Dr. Derek. Thank you, Dr. Derek. So next question is um, Sharon Liu. I find it challenging to find the right or related articles to review for literature reviews according to my topic. Over to you, Derek. <laughs> yeah, sure. You start off with a blank piece of paper, almost, almost like an artist's canvas. And this gives you a certain level of stress, anxiety. How am I going to fill my, how am I going to write this assignment? There's no beating about the bush. You need to do the reading, but work smart. If it's a class assignment, say it's on leadership, everyone goes to the library or online, identifies journal articles, and then what you then do, you may have spent an hour looking at certain journal papers. You might have identified one or two or three within that hour. Then what you then do, and this isn't plagiarism, I could then go to court and say, Co, I've got some really good leadership journal papers. Have you got any? And Co says, yes. So I have a look at Co's papers and say, yeah, I like those. Would you like to swap? You're using each other as a resource. Co is not going to write my answer and I'm not going to write Co's answer. But what you've got to do is you've got to read. Now, you're not going to get the answer straight away. You've got to read breadth and depth. And remember the triangle. The more you read, you start to identify what are the key themes within that. Um, and also another tip, if, you, if you're fatigued looking at your literature review, go on to TED Talks or YouTube videos. Type in leadership and see what comes up. So while you're relaxing, you're listening to the informed discussion. And quite often, that can trigger the idea within that. But also listen to radio shows, international radio shows. Like read the BBC Radio 4 is an excellent forum for knowledge and information. Look at a Sunday, Sunday tabloid on business sector and you'll see how the world is literally a very small casino that everything impacts on everything else. Almost like the domino effect. Thank you, Dr. Derek. Um, okay, another question here from Gordon B. Uh, how to read journal articles more effectively? Over to you, Derek. You, you must be one of my uh, the, the former students or current students. Yes, we get asked that all the time. What students want to do, they want to go online and find the perfect journal that will help them answer that question. Doesn't happen. What you need to do is you need to read a journal paper. Now, you can't speed read because you're not going to take in the information. So what I suggest my students do, because you've got to develop this technique, get a journal paper, relevant title, read the abstract to make sure that it is relevant, and then start to read the journal paper systematically. Now, read it the first time. The second time, read it again, but with a highlighter. Now, be careful with a highlighter because students like to start off highlighting one word, and by the time they're finished, they've painted the journal paper full of highlighter. That's no good to anyone. So what you do is you try to highlight the key themes and then look at the bibliography section, the reference section at the back of the journal paper, and you'll identify who are the key authors in this subject area. Very important. And then at the end, once you've read it the second time, or it may take you a third time when you first start, start reading journals, create a diagram that you, only you, understand cognitively. You're not going to find this diagram in a textbook. This is how you understand the key themes, how they link together in a diagram. Remember the slide I give you with the red hoop. Then you'll read another journal paper and say, right, does this, is this relevant? If it is, then it goes on a, um, a green hoop or a blue hoop. But you keep copies of those journal references because this is what you'll help help you write your journal, your literature review, and also how you will develop your interview questions or your questionnaires. Because quite often students come up with a questionnaire, it's just being plucked from the air. Your questions need to be clearly linked to what's in your literature review, hence the chin in my diagram. Thank you, Dr. Barry. Practice. Thank you. Uh, Any more? Okay, um, we have Adrian here. How to find the right variable when we are writing, we are writing for our literature review? 
over the years of the day. Right. I knew I'd be able to bring in the football, the example of the football match. You may or may have not heard England, I was going to say something, England lost uh, the Euro Championship. They will be spending today and tomorrow reflecting what were the key barriers in preventing them from winning the football game. You will need to read. There's no way around this. You'll need to read, and there's no shortcut. You'll need to read journal papers. you need to put the time and effort in to identify the key themes. Now, if you do your correct word search, and if you're unsure, go to the library support staff who will guide you, educate you, and you can go back time and time again. Well, you will start off having to read a journal paper and identify what are the key themes in this paper? And do they help me help me ask, answer the question? And if you work with your colleagues, for one hour's work that you've done, you can share your journal papers with your colleague if they've done, if they've got equally good papers. So from one hour's work, you could have, if there's a class of 25, one hour's work times 25 hours. So you're working smart. People in business do this and people in higher education do this. It is not plagiarism. It is sharing resources. Okay, thank you, Dr. Derek. Um, I think this is the last question. Um, okay. Uh, we have Justin here. What would be some of the tips on how to get unstuck during our research for the literature to be utilized during our thesis write ups? Over to you, Dr. Derek. Well, First of all, there was an experiment conducted in the United States in which they turned around to the students and said, you decide when you want to submit your assignments, either at the end of the semester or incrementally or whenever. The students that listen to the tutors with their deadlines, they work to those deadlines. So first of all, you've got to have a schedule, a timeline, when you're going to be working on because you've got more than one assignment to work on. So if you leave them to the end, you're going to do at best a week job on every assignment. So plan your time. However, there are times when I try to do start writing journal papers or trying to identify solutions to an organization and it's just not going in. I'm mentally fatigued or my mind's in other places. What I do, time out. I'll stop work and then I'll go to the gym, I'll go for a walk, I'll watch a Netflix movie. But what I've got to ask myself the question is, what's stopping me progressing? Now, it might be, you know, I'm working too hard or I'm not working too hard, i.e. laziness creeps in within that. So it's very much being accountable of your time and making sure that you see something, what you're producing, i.e. when you read a journal paper, you create a diagram so you can explain that system. And if you get in the mode of developing a diagram, when you go for a job interview and you're asked to do a presentation for the employer, all your competitors will use PowerPoint slides with lots of information on. You'll have one slide with a flow diagram. It'll explain that on one slide and you'll get the job because you've differentiated yourself from all your competitors. The same is with education, but I cannot get around it. That's why at the end of the week, you've got to add up how many hours you've played, how many hours you've worked. And as long as they're kind of the same, you're on the right track. Thank you, Dr. Derek, for answering the questions and everyone for your participation. Let's move on now to the instructions of certificates. As promised, everyone who participated tonight will be issued a certificate of participation. To register yourself, please scan the QR code displays on the screen here, or you can click on the link that is uh, found in the comments box now. Please be reminded to type your full name and email address correctly. The certificates will be sent to you through the email address that you provided. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have come to the end of our sessions.
tonight. And um, on behalf of SEGI Group of Colleges, I would like to thank Dr. Derek Watson for his sharing tonight. And to all of our viewers, thank you for tuning and um, we look forward to seeing you in our upcoming episodes of SEGI Global Classroom Series. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.